Bibles to Numbers chapter 25. I want to speak with you in this message on Phineas Stan. You may remember well the story of Phineas, your childhood, maybe not. This may be somebody that you're not well acquainted with, and yet we find in several places in Scripture where Phineas is set forth as an example of what it is to stand for the truth even though it means standing alone. And that's certainly one of the lessons we're going to see here where Christ has been revealed in the heart and given a knowledge of the gospel. There's going to be an intolerance for any way, any form of worship or perversion of the truth away from Christ and the gospel. Let me read for you here of this chapter, Numbers chapter 25. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab, took a liking to the daughters of Moab, and we can see in what sense the whoredom was committed. It wasn't necessarily in a physical prostitution, although there may have been some of that, but verse 2 explains it in the spiritual prostitution. It, is, it would be as if somebody took a liking to somebody else that was in false worship. And maybe they keep themselves pure until marriage, but physically, but spiritually there's a whoredom that is taking place because uh, of being pulled away from the gospel. And being brought over. There's, there's a lot of compromise that goes on in, in relationships. It's one thing, and I know this is tough on young people, because you say, well, where can you find a believing prospect for marriage? Well, you may not. That may not be the case. But when it comes down to deciding where you're going to worship, if you're in that relationship, you need to make, make it clear that it's going to be where, where the gospel is set forth. I believe that's a, that's a determination that everyone that's still unmarried needs to make in their mind. Uh, it, it might bring somebody to sit and to listen and hear the gospel. There's some hope there. But don't compromise over a relationship and say, well, if I want to keep this relationship going, I need to go to their place of worship and cater to them. No. Uh, make it plain in their own minds that it's going to be where Christ is set forth in truth. Otherwise, there's no relationship. And this is where some of the greatest temptations come with young people. Because you find somebody that you know you like, they're likable, maybe they're even moral, they're upright, and yet their whole foundation is based upon a, a works form of worship. That can't be. That can't be. But this is where this is where uh, Israel began to be drawn aside, as verse 2 says, and they called the people under the sacrifices of their gods. God had already ordained one way, and now they were being drawn aside, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. That's the order that's being described here. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Here again, we see an incidence of the Lord's anger toward any way of false worship. See clearly here the, the consequences. The Lord said unto Moses, take all the heads of the people. So it shows right there where the problem began. It began with the leadership. It began with the heads. When it's talking about the heads, it's talking about the representatives who warned the people and, and, and reminded them that there's one way of worship, they began to compromise, and people followed them. See? And he says, take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. Here again, we see representation, accountability. And I can't make my children to be believers. That's a work of the Spirit of God to do, but I can sure warn them. 
And I can sure, as long as they're under my roof, instruct them in the way that they should go, in the way of worship. And if they, in their rebellion, go their own way, they need to know they are fully accountable. Fully accountable. But woe be unto the father, or the head, or the preacher, who begins to say it really doesn't matter. So that sort of compromise has long-lasting effects upon those that we represent. You know, I think of Job. I mean, as his children would eat and drink and feast, he daily offered sacrifices on their behalf. He wasn't trying to control where they went or how they thought, but he knew their only hope was in the blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how he went daily before the Lord on their behalf. And that's one thing we constantly do as parents before the Lord. But woe be to us if we begin to compromise and, and, and make our children or those under us think that it doesn't matter. It does. It does. And Moses, verse 5, said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. Works religion, dear friends, is a, it's an idolatrous, an adulterous religion that can only bring death. And that's really what, what we're seeing here. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses. So while the Lord was, was warning through Moses, and even this hanging and slaying going on, here comes one that was just completely oblivious to the, the consequences of this false worship. He thought nothing of it. Brought this Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. All right? And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of of Aaron the priest saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. He went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through. Here's a guy that was indifferent toward a worship service, a, a time where the people were brought to weep over their sin. And, and uh, in the end, he was thrust through you know, both the man and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. But look at here. Those that died in the plague, God brought, when it says the wrath of the Lord was kindled against Israel, here's how it was manifest. 24,000 people died. 24,000. There's been a war going on in Iraq now for five years. Everybody talks about 3,000 having died over a five-year period. That's in a war. <laughs> Here we have 24,000 that the Lord killed in an instant over this. 24,000. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, hath turned away my wrath from the children of Israel. Now we're going to be looking at Phinehas here as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I believe he is. That there, where there's where there's death, there's satisfaction. That's what the picture is here. Where, where sin is dealt with, there's satisfaction. God's wrath turned away. It's, it's a picture. It's a top. But it shows that even Christ, uh, at the Phineas, as a type of Christ, sin had to be dealt with. By the, by the, the death of these, sin was put to death. It was a symbolic death, but it was put to death that the congregation be spared. It's like in the death of Christ, Caiaphas, the high priest, said it's better that one man die than the whole nation die. So that's there's a picture of satisfaction. Though the, the whole congregation didn't die, they were spared because there was a dealing justly with the sin that Christ did at the cross. All right, but Phineas. The son of Eleazar, verse 11, the son of Aaron, the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. 
That's why I say finished as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Christ, the covenant of peace was made with the Lord Jesus Christ as the captain of our salvation. And he shall have it. And his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. So this goes beyond just something that took place in Israel. Phineas is a type depicting in that act what Christ would do thousands of years later upon whom God had put an everlasting priesthood. Because he was zealous for his God. And here it is, made an atonement for the children of Israel. That was an atonement before God. The word atonement means a covering covering of sin, a dealing with it, a putting away of it in a very real way. Now when Christ came, his was more than an atonement. His was an actual sacrifice that did put away the sin of his people. But here in type, it's described as an atonement. Now, the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianite woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu, a prince of a chief house among the Simeonites. Now this is interesting because he probably thought his position would spare him from any judgment. You know, it's like preachers today. and You know, God wouldn't judge a preacher, would he? Absolutely. Especially when that preacher is committing whoredom in misleading people and, and directing them down the broad way of destruction. You can see some of the implications here. In the name of the Midianite woman, that was slain was Cosby, the daughter of Zur. He was head over a people and a chief house in Midian. But you can see, it doesn't matter whether it was somebody that was of Israel or of Midian. It didn't matter their descent. That's not that, it's not on that basis that God is going to spare anybody. Saul of Tarsus was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And yet, had God not shown him mercy for Christ's sake, he would have been destroyed right along with anybody else. You know, it's not by our place before men. It's by grace before God, you see. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Vex the Midianites and smite them, for they vex you with their wiles, wherewith they have beguiled you in the matter of Peor. And I see that word beguiled. Again, I think of Paul's writing to the Galatians, who have bewitched you? you know, we're, we're talking about people that know better. They have this word. They see what this word says, and yet they still are bent on whoredom. In other words, putting some condition to their worship or salvation based upon what they do, rather than on the work of Christ only. And he says here, they beguiled you in the matter of Peor, and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a prince of Midian, their sister, which was slain in the day of the plague, for Peor's sake. Well, what a scene we have here. As we looked in Numbers 23 and 24, we find that Balaam from Mount Pisgah, he was up on the mountain, and every attempt that he made to curse the people, or Balaam wanted him to curse the people, God wouldn't allow. You look back at those prophecies that we, the four prophecies that we read, as far as Israel's position was, in God's eyes, it said there, as we saw in Numbers 23 and verse 21, he hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him. There's a type and picture of our standing before God in Christ. It's not that there isn't perversion in our experience. It's there. But if Christ has shed his blood for us, then what God sees is absolute righteousness. That's all he sees. That's what it means to be justified, acquitted from all accusation and charges of his law. But what a contrast between that, what we've just seen, with Balaam's pronouncements there from Mount Pisgah, and here in the plains of Moab. You know, we've gone from the fair and the bright now to uh, fall of a people into dreadful idolatry. You say, well, what is, why is this contrast here in Scripture? Well, I believe it's a wonderful sketch of the difference between our position 
as we are in Christ, which is perfect. If Christ died for us, there's it's absolute perfection because of his righteousness imputed against which no enemy, not even God himself, will find fault. But then the reality of our experience, lest we should become prideful and thinking, oh, God, it says God doesn't see any perversion in me. Yippee. I can go on and live like I want to. No, wait a minute. Just wait a minute. We see here the reality of our experience in the valley of, of Moab, where we're daily plunged into all manner of sin and folly. See, it's one thing to understand my, my standing before God in Christ as being per perfect because of that imputed righteousness, but the acknowledgement that, but for the grace of God, I'm just like these children of Israel here in the valley of Moab, and daily am bound over to sin and to folly. And if the Lord had not provided a just satisfaction on my behalf, I would be among those 24,000 that, that had perished. You see, what a, what a strange contrast then when we consider, and this is particularly interesting when I was looking at this, the Lord used a Balaam, a false prophet, to do nothing but pronounce blessing on his people. And yet now raises up a Phineas, a faithful high priest, to bring chastening and judgment. You, you would think it would be just the opposite. But it's, that's the way that God works in his sovereignty, whether for the blessing of his people or for their chastening. Even here, while we see the sad plight of Israel, having been seduced away into idolatry, yet at the same time, we see God's grace and mercy in not letting it go, but bringing the rod of discipline, if you will, in order that the evil thing should be crushed and subdued in our midst. There, there's other examples in Scripture of this. One of mine was in Acts chapter 5. Let me just show you this in Acts chapter 5. I know there are a lot of preachers that worry about keeping the congregation pure, and they try to take this on themselves. They try to make sure that everybody in that membership is right with God. And they, they feel like that's their task. And so they're constantly getting into people's business. They're constantly going over to people's houses and sitting them down and interviewing them. And you, you know me. The only time I've ever been over to your house is when I've been invited. And usually it's for a meal. But that's just the way I believe the Lord directs. I, it's not, they're the Lord's sheep. I have a responsibility when we gather Wednesday evening. I have a responsibility when we gather Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon to set forth the Christ and the gospel to you. If you're his, he'll keep you. It's his dealings with you that keep you by his grace. Now, if people say, well, what if there's something going on that's hidden? Well, the Lord will bring it to light. He'll bring it to light, just like here with Ananias and Sapphira, just like with this the one that brought this Midianitish woman into the midst of the congregation. It, the Lord has his way of dealing with false professors in his time. And, and here's an example in Acts 5. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. They'd all agreed that they would sell what they had and, and give it to help others in the body. All right? No one was told what to sell or how much to sell or what to give. None of that was part of it. Each person did as the Lord directed. But here, the problem was they sold a possession, kept back part of the price, but made like they were given it all. See, there was a deception. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part, a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? See, this wasn't any kind of pledge campaign where everybody had to give a certain amount. No, but after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? You didn't have to pretend like you were given more than you were. You see, why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. That's the point I want you to see. It's just like back here 
in uh, Numbers 25, as, as the Lord was dealing with this matter, there was weeping. There were those that uh, were moved as to their own sense of condemnation because of, of what they had done. And yet, just like while this was going on, here comes Ananias' wife now, Sapphira. Just like this one bringing in this Midianitish woman, like nothing was. The young, uh, it says here in Acts 5, the young men rose, wound him up and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then she fell down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her forth, buried her by her husband. But here it is again, verse 11. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. This wasn't Peter getting together a discipline committee and, and trying to you know straighten this matter out. It was the Lord dealing directly with those individuals as he deemed best. You know, there's a blessing in that, especially for the Lord's church. I, I don't pretend that everybody comes to Shreveport Grace Church as the Lord's. But it's, it's the Lord to sort it out, not me. And he does. He will. He'll, he'll make it plain where there's false profession. He'll also make it plain where, where there are those that the Lord has truly called to himself because Christ has redeemed them. These are things that in his time he makes plain. But I know this, whom he loves, he scourges. As a son, he, whom he loves, he chases. You do, we do that with our children. We chasten them because we love them. Not because we're just trying to be mean, but there's a direct consequence in all things with regard to how we approach God. We'll come back here to Numbers chapter 25. And let me just bring out a few, two actually, two points here to consider about Phineas. First of all, who he was. If you look here in Numbers 25, it says in verse 11, Phineas the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest. So this wasn't just anybody. This was one who was responsible for the care of the people as a priest. So that's why I say he was a type of Christ. Uh, he's going to see to his own. He's, he's not one that perished was one that was truly his own. They, they, this was just the divide. This is the fire that, that was separating the wheat from the chaff. That's the Lord's to do. He knows those that are his. And he knows those that aren't. And there's a way of dealing with his people as was his responsibility. And so he distinguished himself in that role. You know, someone might say, well, what was his right to go in there and spear these two through, uh, you know, without some sort of court? Why didn't he just, you know, grab them and put them in holding until the matter could be settled? Because as the high priest, as the son of a high priest, that was his responsibility to deal with sin, just like with regard to Christ. His role as a high priest was to deal with sin. He came as the sin bearer. And so you see him through this act, as it says there, stain the plague. Sin has to be dealt with one way or another, dear friends. You'll either die the death of the unrighteous yourself, bearing the consequences of your sin, or your sin has already been taken care of in the blood death of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you stand righteous because of that. It's not that God ever overlooks sin. Sin is it's like an accounting. It's got to be put somewhere. It's either been put to the account of Christ, whereby we live, or it's still to your account and will be forever, and you will bear the eternal consequences of that. But here we see Phineas then as a, a faithful high priest, and that's why I see him as a type of Christ. In his prayer in the garden there in John 17, he thanked the Father that the Father had given him power over all flesh to give eternal life unto as many as the Father had given him. It was no accident that this Midianitish woman and this Israelite died. That was their appointed end. 
because of their sin. There was no sacrifice for them. No sacrifice, no atonement. For the others, when that plague was stead, they benefited, not because they were any more worthy, but they benefited because of the action of that high priest, the action of that faithful high priest. And, and that's all we can say. If we're spared, it's only because of the action of our faithful high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see here, if you look back in Numbers 31, because here it says he, he was given an everlasting priesthood. In Numbers 31, we see him even in this one again, not only acting in justice on behalf of the people, as Christ did, but also leading command in the army when they went out against the Midianites later on. Is not Christ the captain of our salvation? That's how the type goes over here. It says in Numbers 31, verse 6, And Moses sent them to war, a thousand of every tribe. Then, here it is, And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, to the war. So we see him going forth on behalf of the people, just like Christ did. He's the captain of their salvation in that he is the priest, the high priest. And it says he went with the holy instruments and the trumpets to blow in his hand. That's a funny way to go to war with holy instruments. But what it's talking about there is the Ark of the Covenant that went before him. That Ark of the Covenant being a type of the Lord Jesus Christ by which God had purposed to deliver and save his people. All the instruments of that tabernacle that was at that time, all that they represented of Christ on behalf of the people. So you can see why I believe Phineas is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. And a little later on, all the way in Joshua, look in Joshua chapter 22, when the representatives of the people were sent to deal with the two and a half tribes who just after crossing the Jordan built an altar and departed without giving them any explanation. Here in Joshua 22 and verse 13, we see Phineas was their leader. And we have his words recorded here in verses 13 to 20. It says, And the children of Israel said unto the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, and with him ten princes of each chief house, a prince throughout all the tribes of Israel, and each one was an head of the house of their fathers among the thousands of Israel. And they came unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, unto the land of Gilead, and they spake with them, saying, Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, What trespass is it that ye have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord, in that ye have builded you an altar that ye might rebel this day against the Lord? Is the iniquity of Peor too little for us, for which we are not cleansed until this day? You can see the lasting effects of what took place there in Peor. Although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, but that ye must turn away this day from following the Lord, and it will be seen you rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be wroth with the whole congregation of Israel. Notwithstanding, if the land of your possession be unclean, then pass ye over on the land of the possession of the Lord, wherein the Lord's tabernacle will dwell, and take possession among us. But rebel not against the Lord, nor rebel against us in building you an altar beside the altar of the Lord our God. You see, there was still this matter of where God was to be worshipped. It's not just up to anybody. It's not just up to you to decide, well, I, you can believe where you want to, but here's my altar over here. No, that only, anything outside of Christ can only bring his judgment and his condemnation. We see over in Psalm 106, verse uh, 30 and 31, again in the Psalms, I'm just trying to show you how he's represented here. Psalm 106, verse 30 and 31, we, we see his name recorded here, where it says in verse 30, Then stood up Phineas, I like this, and executed judgment, and so the plague was saved. 
Right? You see how that's a time of Christ? He stood up and executed judgment. What took place in Christ's representing of his people? Well, he took their sin upon him and put it away. And his righteousness, see, that's how he's accounted here. That whole congregation accounted as righteous, as being atoned for, was the way it's put in the Old Testament, but righteous because of, of Phineas's action. And it says in verse 31, and that was counted unto him for righteousness unto all generations forevermore. He's the righteous one because of his death. That's how the Lord Jesus Christ is. Again, Phineas just being a type. In fact, the name Phineas is mouth of brass. I thought that was kind of a funny name, mouth of brass. I don't know if I want to name my kid uh, mouth of brass, but prophetically, it looks to one whose word is unchanging, just like brass, uncompromising, cannot be perverted. Doesn't that picture our Lord Jesus Christ, the word? You see? Well, why were Phineas's actions commended? We've already touched on it, but let me just sum it up and conclude with this. If you come back here to Numbers chapter 25, again, the word tells us. The word speaks to this. In verse 11 of Numbers 25, it says that God's wrath was turned away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake among them. What was his one preoccupation? Winning a name for himself? No. It wasn't his own popularity, but it was the very glory of God and Israel's good. And in that really how we see the Lord Jesus Christ as well. That's how the finish is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ who had one thing in mind the glory of his Father the satisfaction of God's justice and therefore the deliverance of that people that God had given him to represent. If you look over in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7 Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7 this is a familiar portion that we're used to hearing read at the Christmas season, but this word stands true at all times. You see in verse 6, for unto us a child is born, that's speaking of his humanity, speaking of Christ, unto us a son is given, a son given, that's his divinity. He was the God-man, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Why did Phineas stand up? Well, he had the responsibility for that people. Justice had to be satisfied. And his name shall be called, there shouldn't be a comma after wonderful. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. And that word counselor means advocate, representative. In fact, over in certain parts of Europe, that's how they refer to lawyers. Not as lawyers, but counselors. It's not in the sense of psychologists but the wonderful counselor, he's the wonderful advocate of his people on whose shoulder their, their very responsibility rests. So you can see how Phineas was a type of Christ. He could not let this go. Sin had to be dealt with. He had to deal with sin, even to the putting of death of it, among his people, that they might be spared. And it says, he's the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The only way that peace can be established is through his work. And it was when he came and laid down his life. And it says, verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. That's why it says back here, behold, I give unto him my covenant books with regard to Phineas, you see. And... It says, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it. How? With judgment and with justice. In order for God to be merciful, judgment and justice had to be satisfied from henceforth, even forever. And look at here. The zeal, just like I talked about Phineas' zeal, he was zealous for my name's sake among them. Here it is with regard to Christ. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And was looking forward to that work that Christ would come to come. But we can see how Phineas then is a type. Phineas became the possessor of an everlasting priesthood because of his faithfulness. And so did our Lord Jesus Christ. Even though he was the Son of God, 
Yet as the representative of his people, he had to come, live, and die, satisfy justice, that the wrath of God be removed on their behalf. But having said that, let me just conclude by saying this. I do believe that in this we also see an example of Phineas to all of the Lord's servants that were not to treat sin lightly, either in us or among the Lord's people. I realize we have a message of grace that is to be set forth, but uh, you know the message is, uh, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I guarantee you there wasn't one person that died in that congregation that was burdened for their sin, that was found weeping and repentant before the Lord, because the Lord grants that. But I do know that any that treat it light, I don't care who it is, you, you realize who Phineas had to go after was leaders. He went after a leader in Israel. And, and people would say, no, spare him because of his position. No. No. You know, there's times when our tenderness to men because of their position in life becomes unfaithfulness to God. The Lord's going to put every one of us to a test because it's going to be somebody that we've revered, revered in the sense of respected and looked up to. And yet, they're not to be spared simply because of their position. And we're not to be turned away from the truth and from the seriousness of these matters out of respect of persons. And I, I believe there's a lesson there. It's of the utmost importance for us to be able to discern when those moments come. And warn always stood Peter to his face when he saw him not walking according to the truth. Someone would say, well, what? Paul, the Johnny come lately, who's he to stand up to Peter? Well, at that moment, he needed standing up to. And it was Paul's responsibility to do it. I believe the prompt acting of Phineas and how it preserved the whole congregation from further chastening is a lesson as to why we continue to point men to Christ, no matter who it is. It might be somebody with whom you walked and thought well of, but if they ever go astray, they need to be spoken to. They need to be pointed once again to Christ. And God was glorified in the midst of the people. And the enemy's designs were defeated because of Phineas' action. Well, there's a lot there, but I pray the Lord will be our teacher in everything we've heard. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, I thank you for this time in your word. And I pray that you would ever help us to see the vileness of having one like Phineas, our Lord Jesus Christ, to oversee us and uh, who cares for us more than we care for our own souls. And because of his action, because of his work, we're spared. We deserve nothing but condemnation. But Lord, by your grace, we, we look to Christ. And like the publican, uh, beat our breasts, saying, Lord, be, be merciful to me, thus sinner. I pray that you would impress our hearts from young to old here, cause this Father to, uh, to be brought once again to bow in reverential fear to your name and to the honor of your son. Fill us with a zeal for his glory and honor and the good of men's souls. We give you the praise in his precious name.